Welcome, dear friends. Grace to you and peace on this glorious Sabbath morning as we gather to worship the Lord, to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ on this Easter season Sunday, and to remember with joy the gift of eternal life given us by the resurrected Lord. Let us begin this morning with our call to worship as it comes to us from the book of Acts and from the first letter of John to the early church. Love one another, even when love involves risk. We love <laughs> as God loves us. Love and care for others, even when caring is hard. We love and care as God loves and cares for us. Love in truth and action. By this we are known as children of God. Prayer of Invocation. Shepherd of love, guide our thoughts and our actions that we may too become shepherds of love. Speak to our hearts as we listen this day that our hearts may expand and embrace all of your sheep. Love us fully that we might love all of the flocks of your world as fully as we are loved by you. In your shepherding love, we pray, amen. This morning, we are going to share what I'm calling a prayer of yearning. This is usually the time in the service when we would offer up to God a prayer of confession. 
But our scriptures this morning are all about Jesus being the good shepherd and about love as expressed by John in his first letter to the early church. And what we really yearn for in relationship with God is that, that knowledge that we are loved by God and that, that joy in sharing the love forward. And so I invite you to settle your hearts and pray with me as I offer up a prayer of yearning. Merciful Shepherd, give us the grace to love as you love. Give us the courage to love people who frighten us. Grant us the mercy to love with the same great love you have for us. Guide us as we learn to hear and welcome different voices. Love through us that we may welcome and include every person to your community of love. Awaken our hearts to your generosity when we neglect to embrace and include others. Forgive us when our love is absent and renew your love in our hearts that our love may expand and enfold all of your people on earth. In your love and grace we pray. Amen. And now, Lord, we lift to you our silent prayers of confession and yearning, trusting that in your mercy you do respond with love. Amen. Friends in Christ, there is no greater love than this. The Lord our God sent forth his only Son into the world to rescue us from sin, to show us the way into God's loving embrace, and to give us hope for the future, hope of a resurrected life that, that begins the moment we claim Christ as Lord and celebrate the love we share with all. Amen. Prayer of preparation for the word. Prepare our hearts, O God, to welcome your holy word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also follow your Son and fulfill your call upon our lives. Amen. The epistle lesson this morning is 1 John 3, 16 through 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will be known that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever he asks. Because we obey this commandment and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit that he has given us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. George has already read for you from 1 John 3. I am going to share with you the gospel lesson this morning, uh, which comes to us from the gospel according to St. John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. This is probably, for many of us, a very familiar lesson. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. 
the hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd, and for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A message for our children this morning. I am going to share in a little while a sermon about love. In fact, it's entitled, Let Us Love. And I want to talk to you this morning about the way in which we are told by Scripture to love one another. In one of the letters that the disciple John sent to the early church, he reminds us to love one another. And I want us to think what that kind of love might look like. When he speaks to us of loving one another, what he is encouraging us to do, what he is asking us to do, is to be there for each other, to listen well to each other, and to respond to each other kindly. For instance, in my house, when my children were growing up, one of the things that we all agreed to was that we would not bring anything to the table except ourselves and the food. Anything else, whether it was a video game or it was a book, any of that got left to the side so that we could come together and share at the table and tell all about the wonderful things we did that day and maybe even some of the not so wonderful things. But we always shared with each other, we listened to each other, we giggled with each other, we spent time with each other, and of course we filled our bellies at the same time. To do that, though, you have to really listen when the parents in your household say, it's five minutes to supper, please finish up what you're doing and meet us at the table. I have grandkids, I know they don't always like having to do that, <clears throat> but you know what? It shows love to your parents and love to your God when you listen, when you respect, and you do as you are asked. So this week, I would really like you to spend time thinking about what it means to love others, including your very own parents who you know love you very much, and really try hard to listen to them and to respect them. When they ask you to do something like straighten your bed or throw your clothes in the hamper or come to the table without anything but yourself or the food, I want you to try really hard to do that. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of little children, for all in them that makes us joyful. Bless these children, dear Lord, with opportunities for learning and loving, opportunities for listening and respecting and giving their all to one another in your name. Amen. As I said to the children a little while ago, our sermon this morning is entitled, Let Us Love. And it's all about the way in which John speaks of love in his first letter to the early church. I begin by saying that this has been one of the most bizarre weeks for news in a really long time. You know, on the one hand, there were all these silly little news blips that really made me laugh. There was one about a 49-year-old pastor who was between positions, and she decided to take up pole dancing and loved it so much that it became her new vocation. There was another woman, this one in London, who again was between jobs, and she said to herself, what could I do with my time that might even bring in a little extra money to the household? 
and she started making gingerbread houses. Only it grew into something much more than that, and she started making gingerbread castles and gingerbread museum edifices, all that kind of stuff. But the one that cracked me up was that she even was hired to make a gingerbread based on the old Brady Bunch house in California. This woman probably never saw the Brady Bunch in her life living in London, but there we have it. There was also the woman in Poland who called police for help because she thought that she had an iguana in her tree. And she waited for two or three days and finally called the police and they came, they got up into that tree and they found that what she thought was an iguana was actually a croissant. And then one more. There was a call to police in California by a very worried homeowner who said that there was a burglary in progress in her home and could they please come quickly to help. And so they showed up, they very carefully opened the door and what did they discover? That the burglar was actually the owner's very own robot vacuum. All very funny stuff. But this was also the week that government agencies confirmed, I believe, for the first time that there really are such things as UFOs in the skies above, although they call them something other. They call them unidentified aerial phenomena. Either way, there is evidence that the universe still has some surprises in store for us earthlings, and God knows what those surprises might be. But then at the far other end of the spectrum was the hard news this week. There was the announcement, for instance, that over three million people have died from COVID-19 throughout the world. And this is just the reported number of deaths. What's more, in the face of those deaths, there's been a decline in the number of U.S. Individ individuals interested in getting the vaccine, which would protect them and others from this deadly disease. Far too many Americans are saying that they'll just let others get the vaccines, as that would give them protection without having to take much of a risk themselves. Of course, we all know that that kind of avoidance of vaccination hasn't played out very well and the result will not be herd immunity if as many people that are currently saying they won't take the vaccine follow through on those words. Of course, also in the news this week were all the new travel restrictions, the very bizarre weather patterns that brought us from 78 degrees on Tuesday to, to today's high, which is much lower. And of course, there was Thursday in between there when it was maybe 50 something. We heard about more state governments trying to make it harder for people to vote and an increasing number of deaths by gun violence. Of course, by now we also know the guilty verdict of former police officer Derek Chauvin in the death of George Floyd last summer. While the silly news makes us laugh and gives us a bit of a respite, from the harshness of life on planet Earth, the news of vicious foreign coups that have resulted in the deaths of so many in innocent citizens, and the report of steel smokestacks in India's crematoriums actually melting under the heat imposed upon them by 24-hour-a-day pressure of keeping up with all of those cremations. The reality that most of this news has been for us rather bleak, gives us almost a pain in the heart. We feel anxious and tired and sad. We begin to realize that there are too often times in life when the news and the events around us fall in upon us and create a sense of, of yearning for something new, yearning for something more. Sometimes, though, we turn that so far in on ourselves that we put ourselves before others and spend a whole lot of time asking God to be with us, which is good, 
except when we ask God to be only with us. I have found myself, though, this week uh, asking more times than not, how did it come to us, Lord? How did this great creation of yours come to this? Now, we all know that God gives us the gift of this glorious creation. We also know that God calls us to exhibit justice, humility, and love. But we know as well that we don't always live into God's calling as, as well as we can. And that just saying, I love you, saying we are committed to justice, saying I will be humble before the Lord is not the same as actually doing these things. Saying and doing it are two very different things. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, we hear the beloved disciple exhort the community of faith to show God's unending and unconditional love through their own behavior. These are John's words. Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. John is speaking to the sacrificial nature of Jesus Christ, and he is pointing to the truth that Christ has laid down his life for our sake. John is not encouraging us to vicarious suffering, but he is encouraging us to love, to a love which goes all the way for the sake of others. We see this same theme rise up in John's gospel, where in today's lection, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is one of Jesus' wonderful I am statements in the gospel of John. Others of those statements include, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the true vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. All of these I am statements in some way take the place of what we call the parables in the other three synoptic gospels. You may remember that the other three gospels are called synoptic because they are said to, to be looked at or be written through one lens, one eye, as Matthew and Luke probably based their gospels on the foundation that Mark provided. But Jesus' I am statements in John's gospel call us to see the way in which he nourishes our souls and gives us hope in our despair. Jesus, the good shepherd, gives us a, a sense of that, that spiritual presence all around, the spiritual fluid of grace and inclusion. And he provides us with a way to a life-changing relationship with God, which brings with it such things as peace and resurrection. Now, John frames Jesus' words around the Lord's centerpiece of love. John is describing a love which is selfless, unconditional, and sacrificial. A love which originates with God and Christ and then flows in and through the human steward out into the world. The Greek word for this kind of love is agape, and it describes a communal love in which each one of us cares for others with generosity and with compassion. John makes a point of saying that it, it's not enough to simply speak of love. We must live love. We must live into love by the truth of holy wisdom made evident to us through the teachings and the actions of Jesus Christ. We are led to consider the well-being and the needs of others within the community. And while John was likely speaking of life within the Christian community in, it, in that first century, his calling to love is just as applicable in a broader sense today pointing to a larger world in need with all the complexities of our modern life. But in a culture which 
is so focused on, a, on success and on achieving a certain social standing. Not everyone gets this, that we are to give our all for the sake of the world, working for equity and such things as education, health care, vocational opportunities, access to food and shelter, and the intrinsic value of all God's children. I was with a young father this week who said he was teaching his child to be aggressive and selfish on the soccer field. Now, I get the aggression part. After all, soccer is a sport, and sports are all based on that model of win and lose. But the notion of teaching a child to be selfish while playing a team sport really gave me pause to wonder whether this kind of instruction leads to the notion that in the end it's all about the Benjamins and to the insistence that it's all or nothing. I'm old enough to remember back to the day that Tanya Harding's ex-husband, Jeff Galuli, hired a hitman to assault the figure skater's main rival, Nancy Kerrigan. While Harding's other sport was boxing, and even fighters know what makes for good sport and what doesn't, I couldn't help but wonder if perhaps her behavior wouldn't have been different if she had read or at least given a cursory glance to verse 23 of John's epistle this morning. Harding might have thought that she was justified in supporting her vicious attack. After all, at the beginning of that verse 23, John tells us that we receive from God whatever we ask. Maybe she was able to rationalize that because she wanted an Olympic medal so badly it was okay to bring harm to her competition. But if so, she would have neglected the second half of that verse 23, where John insists that we receive whatever we ask because we obey God's commandments and do what pleases God. ELCA pastor Sharon Blizzard has this to say. If you take only the Twitterish soundbite of receiving whatever we ask from God, you miss the entire point of that passage. If you take only those few words, you might as well be describing God as driving some heavenly pie in the sky ice cream truck through your neighborhood, dispensing treats to the kiddos. No, the author of this epistle, she says, is not preaching an easy prosperity gospel designed to appeal to armchair disciples. This preacher is talking about sacrificial love and stewardship and that lovely subordinating conjunction because links the two parts of this sentence and provides a, a cause and effect relationship between the two ideas. So yes, we receive whatever we ask because we are in line with God's will. A disciple who follows the will and the way of God will not selfishly seek to please him or herself at all cost and will not treat the divine one like a genie in a liturgical body. Genie in a liturgical bottle, I meant to say. Those are some pretty wise words, I think. There is no room for selfishness in the lives of those who are called to love the Lord with all their heart, mind, and soul, and their neighbors as themselves. The whole idea behind this week's reading from 1 John, and indeed the entire letter, is that in the sacrificial love of Christ, we are able to see and experience God. And in so doing, we are compelled to live out that love in word and in deed. The, be the beloved disciple makes it very clear. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. There is a wonderful mutuality at play here, a cause and effect that does produce quite 
and effect. God's love is made real to us in Jesus Christ and in the way in which the Son of God lives and loves, loving us to death and beyond. This is some pretty powerful stuff, this kind of love. It really is not one of those I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back sorts of love. This is love that is poured out with, without regard to cost or benefit to one's own self. This love is one that demands no return. This love is one that will not let a needy sister or brother go without help. This is the kind of love that is practiced by Mother Teresa, by St. Augustine, by countless mission co-workers and servant leaders, and also by ordinary disciples like you and me. What does it mean then to lay down our lives for one another? We may never be called to give up our physical lives for someone else. But it could happen. The truth is, though, we are called to put our own wants aside and to do what needs doing for the sake of others, to share their burden, to help alleviate their pain and suffering when and where we can. This kind of love means looking at our glass as always full enough to share, as being content with enough and not hoarding our time, our talents, or our possessions. To, to lay down one's life for another means that as we live together in community, we work at the hard parts of being in this thing called life and faith together. And we work hard at staying together. Now what this may look like in real life is as varied as the situations themselves. But it may mean that we really try to watch our words carefully for the good of the body. It may mean taking the back seat and letting someone else drive for a while, both physically and metaphorically. And it may mean, as Sharon Blessard says, that we don't pack up our little red wagons and go home at the first sign of discord or at the expense of our neighbor. Friends, God loves us, pure and simple, flaws and all, and it is this gracious love that frees us to love others as well. What's more, this knowledge of God's love and God's grace, if we allow it, can fill us so completely that we're able to pour ourselves out for others without worrying that there won't be enough love or anything else left for us. Once we truly experience the love of God in Christ, we are compelled to share that love forward, however imperfectly in thought, word, and deed. So friends, when the news of the community, big and small, near and far, is silly, let's have a good laugh. When it's good, let's share it. And when it's bad, let's share it too. But let us do so with an extravagant kind of love, pouring ourselves out for one another for the sake of the gospel. Let us love with broad strokes, broad strokes of generosity and compassion. Let us love without condition or the restraints of prejudice. The world can be a very harsh place on which to dwell, which is why we find ourselves asking, like I did this week, how did it come to this, dear Lord? How did it come to this? But if we want to see more good news, than bad news, more health than disease, more wisdom than ignorance, a more sustainable earth, and more viable provisions for all, then love is our tool. 
Perhaps we would do well to heed the teaching of Mahatma Gandhi as well, for it was Gandhi who famously said, you must be the change you want to see in the world. Friends, let us love as Christ first loved us with a selfless care that changed the world forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, you gather us together once again to hear your word, to celebrate our faith, and to covenant anew, to embody that faith as much as possible. You know, dear Lord, those places where we are weak and where we are strong. We know them too, although sometimes we try to hide the weaknesses lest anyone else should see. But you call us, dear Lord, to the kind of love that says, despite the events of the world, despite our differences, despite any weaknesses we might find within ourselves and within our community, the call is to move beyond those weaknesses, move beyond those differences, and find a common value in love. May we find that common value as we see all of our brothers and sisters as equals, as peers. May we, as we look upon the faces of others, see the very image of your nature and of your love in one another. Lord, we pray to you this day for our nation's leaders. They are certainly faced with some very difficult decisions to make and difficult actions to follow through on. May we, as much as possible, give them both the guidance, the support, and the concern that we have regarding the decisions that are made. Help us to remember, Lord, that we all have the right to speak and to vote. We all have the right to hear our voices, to share our voices, and to make certain that others can share them too. We pray for our local leaders and ask that you would bless them with good discernment over issues facing the city of Goshen in months and, and years ahead. We pray especially, dear Lord, for those near us and those further away that are struggling still under the weight of illness or grief. We remember to you the families who have lost loved ones to the COVID-19 pandemic and pray that you would continue to bless them with peace even amidst their grieving. We pray for those who are members of this church who struggle in any way. We pray for Gene Tucker, uh, who had a reaction to his COVID-19 vaccine that was very concerning, but Gene is doing much better, and we give thanks to you, dear Lord, for that. We pray as well for Louise Spencer. I understand that Louise is doing better, perhaps not as well as she would like, but she is doing better. And again, Lord, for that we give you thanks. We ask your prayers for this church that you might continue to, to strengthen it and give it new vitality and energy as together we march forward into a new future. And we pray for the leaders of this church, Lord, that they might truly lead into a bright future with a banner of love, justice, kindness, and yes, even humility. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, you have heard the word of God this morning as it comes to you through the pen of John, the beloved disciple, the one who followed Jesus and offered up this gift as an early disciple to the community of faith that rings true still to this day. We are to love God and love one another with a love that is not just contained to words and, and, and thought, but to deeds and actions that speak volumes about who we are and who God is to us and through us. So go, go out into the world. Let us all love. Let us give something of ourselves to those in need. And remember that each time we offer up a, a slice of bread, a glass of water, a simple shelter to those in need, we do so in the name of our Lord. And now may the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.